the path to zero emissions in buildings and urban habitat goes right through the building skin. I mean, it is the key to achieving this stuff. How do we push that innovation piece and encourage the the next generation who's coming into the industry, the younger, you know, tier of like, this is really important. And it's also a huge opportunity. You know, I think that's the big piece that we're missing in the conversation. So this is going to be uh, per Spencer's recommendation. We have a, a real um, heavy hitter industry veteran on the, on the call or on the podcast rather. And what I think is, Gonna be really interesting to have the two of you really riff on is I, I like to talk a lot about um, stick built versus prefabricated or unitized assemblies and, and I, I know Mick you were really kind of kind of call it an innovator or a trendsetter in the space so you were picking up on or pushing for a lot of these innovations or alternate means and methods of uh, delivering or executing on projects and so even some of the pushback we hear today, I can only imagine what that looked like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, I remember there was this um, clip from uh, Nick Bagatello's talking at Glass Build about how he's, you know, the guy to innovate, innovate, innovate. But I think he was describing in the early 2000s when he was trying to bring some of these motorized hardware or unique uh, Shuko systems into the States, you know, people would say, oh, that's great. But for, you know, 400 bucks a foot, nobody wanted to hear it. So I guess we can uh, start from there. Yeah, well, you know, uh, cost is always something to talk about, but that's what we talk about all the time. You know, I mean, uh, that's a problem, right? So, you know, and the problem there is life cycle thinking. We don't have it, right? Especially from the decision makers who tend to be, uh, you know, the developers, the building owners and, you know, especially when you're talking about spec buildings, um, you know, it's, you know, first cost ought to be criminalized, you know, the first cost consideration, right? You know, because it burdens society for the li whole lifespan of that building and the decisions are made on the basis of what that initial cost is going to be. So I can't tell you how many times I've seen, you know, uh, I've seen valuable performance related um, solutions incorporated into even the basis of design, you know, uh, and also, you know, finally the construction documents and that kind of thing that get, you know, that get VE'd out because somebody in the supply chain says, hey, I could save you 2% here or whatever, you know, uh, you know, if, if it's not already gone, <laughs> you know, it ends up going before. And that's what happened to, you know, to, um, for, uh, to building in, in BIPV, building integrated photovoltaics, you know, it's just, it's been talked about for literally decades now, and it's just really never happened in any kind of significant way because it impacts first cost. But the society is stuck with, you know, the building performance over the whole life cycle of the building. Yeah, it's it's funny or interesting how, I'm sure you're both familiar with, um, you know, a lot of the high-end, call it residential buildings in New York that were done by the Permas, the Encloses, the Bensons, and so forth, where, um, you can see a distinct difference in quality of build in a condo versus a rental building. And I think it really kind of art, art is articulated or uh, pans out when you then trace into the interiors and how you might have a Kerbal embed totally exposed <laughs> on the ceiling or so, you know something foolish like that. Or even little things like if, if the operable window hardware has a built-in limit arm that works uh, if the awnings uh, can be operated with under 40 or 50 pounds of force, um, the, these little things that, you know, I, I started with Israel Berger on the facade consulting side and and I got exposed to some of the highest end um, private developments from World Trade Center development to Manhattan West and Hudson Yards, these kind of cream of the crop, every little detail is scrutinized. And I feel like over my career, more and more the onions being peeled back as to what actually happens in the 99% of, of the as-built world today. Um, so I, I guess I'll start, like, wh where do you think that that disconnect is? I even feel Spencer at times has been exposed to such, you know, unique, high-end, um, custom-oriented project teams that have really scrutinized their spec sections, uh, enforcement on site, enforcement of code. Um, and then there's the rest of the market. 
So do you really feel like we're in just this little niche bubble and we have these fun conversations, but it's not really resonating throughout? I mean, I, from what I see, it's, it, it's so dependent on the ownership, you know, and I mean, of course it gets down to, you know, what the goals of that individual project are. Right. But, you know, I agree with Mick that the, the first cost basis for a lot of this is the driver, but it's the it's the client that ultimately is behind those decisions, right? And and the decisions of how, you know, if they're if they're a private developer, how they're making money on their project and what the value of the kind of long-term integrity and resiliency of the building is relative to their business model, right? You know, but then you have institutional clients who hang on to the property, who who have this kind of a long looking view. And these are very much in the minority, I would say, but you know, that's a very different calculus than a condo building. You know, if you're going to be an academic institution, you're going to hold on to this building for a hundred years, right? And the user comfort is almost as important, right? As some of these other metrics that are evaluated, um, then it, it changes the equation entirely, right? But that's totally client driven. So, you know, I think that it's, you know, when we talk about broad strokes with the market, like, sure, like those are those are niche projects, right? And I and I think there's, I, I agree with Mick that there's this kind of fundamental challenge that we have, because we look at this from, say, kind of the engineering product side, manufacturing side. And then there's also the responsibility of like, you know, what we're providing and what we're selling and making, right, as manufacturers and engineers. But ultimately, like, we're only able to bring to market what people are going to buy. You know, so that's like this hard truth. It's like we may have these aspirations to do high performance buildings, to do BIPV, to, you know, do low carbon buildings. But it's like the challenge is always like we're, we're bringing these like goodwill intentions to the equation. But then we're still relying on like the customer to like buy into that, you know, and and the needle shifts, you know, with codes, with mandates that everybody has to kind of play by these rules. But that takes so long for that stuff to kind of evolve, you know, and it's trending in the in a positive direction, I would say. But it's, you know, mix been in it a lot longer than I have. You know, you've really seen the progression of the industry. Um, but that that's kind of my hot take on it, I would say. Yeah. Uh, yes. And I think it's facades more so than anything. It's a type of thing where you have to live it and feel it, especially in your real life uh, home application, for instance, or in your office building to understand the effects of solar heat gain and not putting the right um, coating on the glass. Or I just moved into a new construction rental building and it's a high rise Kermel building, but Spencer, like they have this little dinky roto operator hardware on. And so, you know, to get things to operate and then I close it and you can feel the air infiltration, exfiltration right around the perimeter. But this is a rental building. So if someone was coming in here and spending $5 million on the unit, they might complain. But I don't rent this unit. Somebody else is going to rent it. And that's not stopping people. So to kind of play off that, Mick, your comment about cost, you know, I think cost is always going to speak and you're always going to have low bidders and alternate systems being proposed that may veer from basis of designer spec. But in our call it post-COVID world and right now our... Um, our, our sort of inflation challenge, uh, especially with limited supply chain, do, even if interest rates are cut and construction activity uh, spikes, do you do you think we're in a new era now where everything becomes cost driven? Do you think that's kind of exasperated at the moment more so than prior times? Uh, I guess the question is, do you think we're going to slingshot back in the other direction or do you think we've uh, uncovered or turned a stone that can't be uh, turned back? Well, you know, it's a, it's a, that's a complicated question. And, you know, it's like, they're just some of the problems that I recognize in facade systems are extremely difficult to deal with without some incremental cost increase, right? You know, like the whole lack of adaptive capacity in facade systems, for example, right? It's a, it's a design problem, like sustainability problems. It's like I saw Bjark Ingels years ago in New York City. Uh, you know, speak at the McGraw Hill Center, you know, in one of those conferences, the innovation conferences that he used to have, I think it was, you know, he said, he said, uh, sustainability is a design problem. That's absolutely right on the money. That's the truth, you know, but solving those problems uh, is really difficult to do without impacting cost. And, you know, that's a level of innovation uh, that we're not very good at, right? Solving those problems uh, and making and not adding to the cost burden. It puts a layer 
of complexity on innovation that, that makes it really difficult. And we're not good at innovating anyway. You know, I mean, the building industry, we talk a lot about innovation and it's like, it's more, uh, you know, techno babble than anything else, right? I mean, I don't think, uh, I don't think we know how to innovate. I don't think most people in the industry understand what innovation is, you know, much less how to achieve it. Um, so, you know, I don't know, it's the, you know, the cost thing. I mean, I saw, you know, I was, I was with Shuko fairly recently for a while and I saw, um, you know, these specs come out of the, you know, architectural community that were, you know, specking Shuko, specking Shuko level performance and time after time, it ended up being what Connie or 1600 Spencer. That's like, you know, and it, you know, it's, and I, you're, you know, you're right. I've been in this, this industry a long time, too long, right? I am frustrated and impatient. <laughs> this stuff all should have happened a long time ago. We should be way ahead of where we are now. And just like, you know, the, the talk with innovation, it's, it's the same thing. I, I, you know, I, I like to call it sustainable babble. You know, we talk a lot about resilience and sustainability. You know, it's like talking about God. Everybody that is in the conversation has a different idea in their head of what that is. And yet we think we're communicating and we're not yeah. we're talking about something different, you know? Well, okay. So if you look back at your younger self trying to change the industry, trying to trend set, would you have steered yourself in a different direction? Do you, do you feel as though now you put your best foot forward? Well, you know, my start in the industry was not in the curtain wall business, right? It was adjacent to the curtain wall business. Um, you know, uh, I started basically, you know, essentially in a, in a, uh, in a deep way with structural glass facades, right? So, you know, uh, I had a company called ASI advanced structures incorporated, and we brought the uh, high transparency technology into the U S marketplace, you know, for the first time, right. And we were, a bunch of young designers and engineers watching what was going on in Europe at that time. And this is like, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, when you pick up a glass magazine in the US and there were, it wasn't about glass, not a glass magazine, a building magazine, right? And it wasn't about glass, you know, it was opaque facades with punched windows. But in Europe, it was all of these, these spectacular exposed structures, uh, you know, high transparency structures. So you know, we were all just totally fascinated with that, looking for opportunities to do it in the U.S. market. And it was uh, at that time that the marketplace started to change. And architects were like asking for that. Hey, what, you know, I want to do a project like Foster, or Grimshaw or whatever. How do, how do I do that? You know, and and we, we you know, quite literally knocked them off. <laughs> I looked at what they were doing and, you know, just started bringing it. We found out who the suppliers were. Uh, and, you know, our, um, our theme was kind of uh, um, implementing innovative building technology, right? So we had to discover what innovation was, and we did, you know, we, we ended up, you know, borrowing that technology, but truly innovating as we move forward. And we did 16 years of that kind of work. And a lot of that was with curtain wall companies, right? Big curtain wall companies. So we were doing like a lobby area and, you know, projects that were like, you know, a half a million to, you know, three or four million dollars, right? So, you know, the, the feature work, right? And we're doing that as a, a subcontractor uh, on many occasions to a big curtain wall contract that's doing the whole high rise building, right? So, you know, I was adjacent to uh, that technology and really didn't understand it. I was very curious about it, but I couldn't understand what these really complex extrusions and stuff were all about. You know, what's going on with all these weak channels? Because our stuff was all butt glazed silicone and it didn't leak, you know? So it was, you know, uh, it, you know, it just didn't leak. It was, a, it was a different technology, but we were, you know, in 2007, uh, 2006, 2007, we were acquired by Enclose. Uh, and I got the, you know, I really got the deep exposure to curtain wall systems, you know, at that point in time. So, you know, I, you know, that's, that's kind of when, and it, and it, it wasn't really until I, um, I did a, uh, I, I, I pursued a late career educational experience. Uh, you know, went back to school at USC and got the opportunity to sort of do a 180 on the technology I've been working with and really started to take apart, uh, you know, the curtain wall stuff to understand what the essential problems were 
uh, that I came to, to, you know, to a deeper understanding of what the issues are with this technology. Yeah, I think the, so let me kind of be the moderator and let's pretend it's just you and Spencer speaking here. I, I've, I've met now, conversed with real industry veterans like yourself, you know, people either on the facade consulting side or, or the uh, architecture, the design community side predominantly that just have this phenomenally just diverse experience really left a mark on the industry, but leave the industry with a very kind of negative tone and a little bit of a saltiness to them. Um, how would you encourage Spencer uh, to continue on and try to, you know, make his mark and to make a change in the industry? Well, I mean, Spencer is, is, I don't, I don't think, I don't think there's much that I can, uh, you know, th that I can give to Spencer, at least that, that I haven't already done. I mean, we, we've spent some time together. Uh, he's on a great trajectory. He's got a great educational experience behind him. Uh, he's working with a great company, uh, you know, technology leader, performance leader in the industry. He's had, had a substantial exposure to what, to the, to the technology, facade technology in Europe, uh, Germany in particular, you know, which ever since the energy crisis in, uh, you know, the 1970s when, you know, Germany manda mandated significant form performance increases in, in building performance, like, I don't know, you know, 70, 80% improvements over a two to three year time frame that was mandated. And that drove facade technology a couple of decades ahead of what was going on in the U.S. And, you know, to uh, to some extent, we're still playing catch up. Yeah. So Spencer's doing fantastic. Well, maybe, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I hate for this podcast to kind of devolve into, you know, focusing on my personal trajectory. I think maybe the question is a little bit more broadly to, let's say the next generation, right? You know, I know that you're doing, and I'm, you know, starting to collaborate in this, you know, the excellent work that like, you know, the Facade Tectonics Institute is putting together to kind of set like some initiatives outside of the day-to-day -day business, right? That are a little bit more forward thinking that gives us a platform to kind of engage in that stuff. And I think that's a really important piece of this conversation because you know what we're discussing in my mind is like how do we how do we address this issue that you identified Mick of like lack of real innovation in our industry you know lack of like progress right technological progress you know I think we get so caught up at least in my own experience of kind of the day-to-day -day, you know execution of the business right like we're working with the same materials we've been working with for 20 years you know aluminum glass structural silicone the thermal brakes haven't evolved that much in terms of the material and you know their capabilities it's just different dimensionally than what it was before you know and i think that you know if there's a if there's a broader opportunity or goal here that we can start to maybe hone in on it's like how do we push that innovation piece you know and, and encourage the kind of the next the next generation who's coming into the industry, the younger, you know, tier of like, this is really important. And it's also a huge opportunity. You know, I think that's the big piece that we're missing in the conversation is that if you look at a lot of like major progress in other industries, they're totally separate from the facade industry, right? It's like innovation is also massive opportunity. If you can, if you can harness that and channel it, like the, the upside is huge. And so it's, it's not just about like the responsibility we have to kind of push this stuff. There's like a real like business opportunity behind it. If you can, if you can do it the right way, you know, and, and really kind of disrupt the market that you're in, you know, and I think from, from my experience that at least the core focus for the past, you know, better part of 10 years has been, how do we improve the overall energy performance of the envelope, right? Like it's, it's not about materials. It's just about, here's the material palette that we have to work with. Here's like the, here's, here's the technology platform. How do we maximize what we can get out of that? you know, for like passive house envelopes, for example, you know, we got really good at that, but that's more of a, it's, it's like a, a calculus on like how to optimize. It's not really going much beyond that. You know, there's some interesting stuff on the horizon with vacuum insulated glass. And I kind of don't want to go into that in too much detail. Cause I feel like we've, we've talked about that ad nauseum. We kind of know what the issues are, but you know, I think the, the next, the next big push I'm seeing is the, the, the low carbon initiatives. Right. And that's, it's potentially really disruptive because inherently a lot of the materials we work with have huge carbon footprints right so that's going to force like a re-examination of like what's the platform that we're working with here or more importantly like what's the supply chain you know and that and that's a big deal i mean i think it's exciting it's a little 
a little scary you know looking at it from the perspective of a company that sells aluminum products right we're kind of like oh like that's one of the biggest defenders you know but hey like we're gonna have to face the challenge so i, well, I don't know maybe maybe we could you know talk about that a little more like what are the other opportunities that you're seeing you know I've, and we can get into the low carbon but that that's something i'm very curious to get your opinion on the, the other thing that i i want to yes i really like that direction and I, what i want to take a step back for a second on is that we're talking about all these new innovations and in VIG and some iteration of BIPV or dynamic glass, but what about what we have today and just more implementation of it? And so talk about codes and the, the effectiveness of the codes or how much they're being enforced. It's like, look what's happening in New York City. We got local law 15 and now you see bird friendly glass everywhere. Um, local law 97, who knows? We'll see how it's implemented. But in New York, we have these special inspections. And a lot of times people focus on the life safety issues. So they look at structural components, welding, curtain wall anchorage, because that could be detrimental to society. But everything else was kind of brushed off. Air infiltration, you know, who cares? But now there's a the thermal section or energy performance section to it, um, the TR8, where technically people are supposed to be monitoring how much insulation what type of insulation is behind the back pan you know how are they air sealing how are they fire safing so some design some authorized uh, or licensed professionals supposed to be taking ownership of that scope and monitoring it so i guess let's let's talk about maybe the technology we have today is good enough and it's just not effectively being implemented or enforced yeah, well, you you know, you had uh, Helen Sanders, I think, on your podcast, Adrian, and she speaks very eloquently and knowledgeably to this, you know, and she's done some webinars and this kind of thing. And, you know, there's yeah, this is a real problem, right? There, it's 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 a component of innovation. Actually, you don't have an innovation until it's adopted. Right. I mean, there's market adoption is a metric of innovation. And we got way too much stuff sitting on the shelf and the drivers to uh, use that stuff are just not there, you know? And and in some cases, these things don't even cost more, right? Uh, it's just a matter of, um, of, of practice, right? It's a matter of familiarity, right? People like to work with what's familiar. And the, and the real drivers to, you know, solve these problems of performance, of sustainability, of resilience, uh, you know, um, they're, they're not there. And, so, you know, this, this code thing that you talk about is huge. Uh, you know, the problem with code is, you know, that old axiom, you know, it's code is the, you know, what tells you how uh, to build the worst building code minimums. And that's what codes get used for, right? But still they have, they play a role, right? And so, you know, that, that's one thing, you know, that we are, actually, I think our most active group at Facade Tectonics is our advocacy committee, uh, which is, working with the different code groups, a very, very great bunch of people that we have there and trying to move those codes forward. And they're doing it successfully. They, they just had a big success with the GSA. Uh, they made, you know, the group, our group made many recommendations uh, for their standard document uh, for all of their buildings. Uh, and most of them, almost all of them were, were incorporated into the new document. Uh, they've had success with uh, Title 24 in California, uh, you know, with the International Energy Code uh, Group, uh, and they're kind of, you know, it's it's a limited group of people with limited bandwidth. It's all volunteer based, but they're making headway here, you know. And and you know, it's it's frustrating because again, because I see the barriers that they run into, and the barriers typically are, you know, industry vested uh, materials and practices that don't want to see change, right? Like the glass industry, for example, you know, I mean, uh, I saw this happen in 2010 uh, um, with uh, the um, uh, with the ASHRAE code, right, 90.1. Uh, they they adopted a new standard that reduced the window to wall ratio uh, to 30% for 40%, and the glass industry was kind of asleep at the wheel when this happened. But when it happened, they woke up and they went after it, and this was actually a done deal code, they got it changed, you know, so they got it pushed back to 40%. And it's, you know, so, you know, our, our world these days, our reality is controlled by these entrenched vested interests, very, very stubborn, very difficult to move forward. 
So these people show up at these code meetings, you know, when you're trying to implement these changes and really, you know, make big arguments against them. It's going to cost more. It's not realistic. The contractors are not going to be able to pull it off. The, you know, the, um, the, the, the fabricators can't do it. They'll not be able to control quality. Uh, so we, we go to these things and we bring general contractors, we bring architects, we, we try to bring the whole constituency with us so everybody can say, yes, we can do it. Yes, we can do it. But even then, it's it's difficult. It's a challenge. Yeah, and I try to think about these topics in terms of, you know, I, th I think Spencer's a little um, biased towards the uh, heating dominated climates and passive house community. But in respective markets, it makes sense. I don't think you need to sell a hyper insulated shuko curtain wall in Houston. Um, it's it's a tougher sell, and if there's just not a need for it. But coming up with market specific stretch codes, local codes, whatever are that are most applicable to the market. I mean, I'm not really. I, I don't want to speak um, uh, immaturely on there. This wrong word. I, I'm why bird friendly was implemented and is so strict in New York. I guess somebody made the uh, loudest noise and made an, uh, made that change. But you know, having the Florida approval. Um, Florida approval process for the hurricane impact in Florida makes sense. Having the Massachusetts stretch code, uh, just given their cold climate, makes sense. But not trying to adopt this one size fits all code for the entire country because it's just it's just inappropriate and not applicable in so many locations. Yeah, most of the codes have zones, right? So you know they they do. It's not like they don't address that. Uh, but certainly, you know, you're absolutely right, of course, and. You know, so I think some of the most interesting um, facade developments that I've seen lately uh, are, the, are, are in Singapore. You know, what's going on in Singapore? The architects there, the facade systems, you've got a tropical climate, very challenging in an entirely different way than you have like in Canada or, or whatever, you know? Um, and you've got, you know, you've got uh, architects like Ken Yang practicing there, eco architect, you know, uh, really some interesting stuff going on. I don't know. It's, you know, there are some hopeful things going on here and there, yet the industry as a whole lags really terribly. And, you know, Spencer already brought up, you know, this notion of disruptive change. I'm all for it. If I could figure out how to do it today, I would do it. I've been working at that for a long time. Uh, and it's just, um, you know, it's, it's a tough sell. Well, let me ask this. Are there facades you've worked on, I'm sure with Enclose, facades you've executed in the past. I'm trying to think of projects I've worked The The um, pyramid-shaped building on the west side of Manhattan, there, there's another one that I worked on with Enclose, uh, maybe not 50 West, um, by the UN, I believe, current wall building on the uh, east side of Manhattan. But do you look at some of these facades you've implemented in the past and think like, for you know, it's not hundred percent, but 80, 90 percent, we checked off the most boxes. Like this is the means of building. Um, and then with that, you know, are are these companies continuing to try to find ways to reduce costs to give developers motive to continue building that way? Especially with the domestic manufacturers, when we when we run into the challenge of uh, overseas labor, offshoring. And the price pressure you get from these new contractors and manufacturers coming into the market, I guess, what is the feasibility that you see of a lot of these domestic unitizers or manufacturers and and their future? Interesting question. You know, I mean, uh, uh, Spencer may be able to speak to this better than I because uh, I haven't been paying a whole lot of attention to it. But you know, the passive house and what's going on in Canada, uh, you know, one of the trends that I see that is addressing some of these problems that you're talking about are not coming out of the curtain wall companies. They're coming out of other uh, other startups and other uh, adjacent industries to the curtain wall industry, other contracting operations, but uh, it's this mega panel stuff, right? Where you know, they're moving away from conventional unitized curtain wall. You got a big, huge panel, which minimizes the perimeter area of the, the unit, okay? Which is very helpful, right? But again, your layers of the onion, Adrian, it was only recently, you know, relatively recently that we recognized that those perimeters were a real problem. <laughs> we were solving, you know, the performance issues with the glass and we were leaning on the glass industry to provide better and better products until finally they were, it was getting really tough. And we started looking at the framing system and, 
hey, what do you know? This is like, this could be 15% of the surface area of the facade system and it performs terribly. And, you know, there was no talk about thermal breaks at that point, you know, I mean, maybe in Europe, but certainly not here in the US. Uh, so, you know, that is a potentially disruptive move right there, right? You've got different people that have emerged now like Island and there are other ones in, uh, in Canada that are not the conventional uh, curtain wall people. And, you know, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens there, right? Because, you know, suddenly, you know, reducing the window wall, the wall ratio is not a problem. You can use that opaque area to super insulate, uh, you know, things like that don't get talked about much, but that I recognize it's easy to change out a punch window. You can put a really good high quality, you know, Suco window in that mega panel and you can change it out if there's a problem, you know, no, no, no issue there. As opposed to a curtain wall, which, you know, changing a unit in a curtain wall system is a nightmare, right? I mean, it's a destructive process. That's why you don't see, that's why you see so many of these uh, mid um, 20th century buildings in New York City that have not been renovated, you know, because it's just really- the windows are blocked out every 40 to 50 years, but the, the opaque structure will, should last you a hundred plus. Right, exactly. Well, so let's talk a little bit about sort of stick built versus prefabricated and unitized. And we've had this conversation so many times on the podcast, but you know, Spencer is so tied to better acoustics, better U value, better this, but isn't the bigger driver or the bigger mover thinking about stick building a structure, a 20 story structure and the additional three, four, five, six months on construct on the construction site, all the embodied energy, all the effort and time spent on that, wouldn't that be a bigger driver? than to just try to improve the U-value by 10% of the system? Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest you know driver ultimately for that decision, my experience comes down to labor costs and logistics, right? Unless there's some driving aesthetic requirement, you know, where you need like really minimal framing and the stick system can give you that. But, you know, from a, a performance perspective, uh, you know, in general, you can achieve better values with stick systems than unitized. You know, if you really get to the kind of the upper echelons of like U values and and but better you know, performance what on that. paper or actually on site because all the additional joinery. Think about all the loss. Yeah, well, it's it comes down to you know the fact that with the stick system, you don't have any stack joints or coupling mullions, right? So you're inherently you have less of this framing area that Mick was referring to that's a major weak point potentially with a lot of thermal bridging or let's say not thermal bridging just lack of insulation right it's zones in the section that just don't have insulation you know there's air cavities or there's aluminum or there's gaskets but you know with with the stick system you can kind of minimize that but you know it's interesting we'll look at projects you know in um, the southern states that we would never ever do as unitized or as stick as stick products you know in in New England, but the labor rates are so much different in those southern states that they're like, yeah, we're going to stick build this. And I'm thinking to myself, like, that that's crazy. You know, the the amount of labor is going to be insane. But they're like, yeah, it's fine. It's you know, the labor market is different, right? And that's that's a huge driver for for that decision making process on a lot of jobs. It comes down to, you know, also the access, right? Like unitized construction and panelized wall systems you know, I have such a presence in the market in, in bigger cities because of the optimization of getting the material onto the building, you know, just cladding the building in a panelized fashion or a unitized fashion is so much more efficient than if you stick, stick build it and then glaze it on site. Right. So, and, and there's huge, huge opportunity for innovation there, but it's, um, it, it it's kind of like two different worlds of construction, you know, it's like very, very, very different applications. The the worst case of that as of late, I was in a southern city. I, I posted about it recently. I didn't want to blow the project team up, which I wouldn't do. But it was a 28 story high rise um, framed out sheathing. I think it was EFIS, but um, stick built punched openings as if it was a storefront system within the openings, and you must have had 60,000 square feet of it. I mean, absolutely insane. And I was I, I kind of was digging with the I just have a friend of the GC uh, asking how is that feasible and I think this one glazing contractor just has endless unlimited labor so they literally had 20 plus people on the floor all day long stick building um you wouldn't see that up here Spencer I don't think I've ever walked around New York City in a 10 plus story 15 plus story building and seen someone stick building an opening but 
in the opaque area, it's still very common um, for your traditional stick build in elevations or, or facades that look, have a lot of reputation and could be penalized. So, you know, there's the one side, maybe you have uh, limited contractors that can fulfill the market, which I don't think that's the case. I think there's a lot of people today that can deliver that type of facade. But still, I think you have GCs looking at their estimates and penciling out, you know what, it's cheaper to get some mason to come on and hand lay the brick 20 plus stories on a double decker scaffold instead of spending 10% more on an island or somebody up front and saving all that time on the back end. I mean, and schedule is also a driver, right? Like if, if they've got time, you know, to do the on-site, you know, more traditional methods of construction and the labor force is there Why not? and the requirements of the building aren't, you know, extraneous, then it's like, yeah, it's, you know, they just kind of follow that path. But, you know, it's, there's a bit of a challenge there to overcome that because, you know, in a way that's, that's always going to be part of the mix of the industry, you know, and, and especially, you know, on scopes of the project, like on the lower floors, like Mick was referring to, there's always going to be these monumental pieces on tall buildings, right? At the podiums, the podium scope is always going to have this kind of different aesthetic. And in general, you know, the trend for a lot of these projects is that it's almost impossible to unitize or prefabricate some of the stuff because the, the scale is just so monumental, yeah. you know, and, and so that kind of forces this, you know, continued, you know, trend of like, those companies are going to exist, that that material, those systems are always going to be kind of part of the mix, because it's, it's just a different aesthetic, it goes beyond the, say the the limits, the limitations that you have with these prefabricated wall systems or unitized systems, you know, it's a different, a different product, a different aesthetic. I mean, the, the, other, biggest... the other consideration is um, quality, right? I mean, you yeah. know, you, you, you know, stick built on site, you've got the vagaries of the site condition, you've got you know, like you, like you said, Adrian, you got a you got a big workforce that can do this stuff. Well, how well trained is that workforce, and and how do you control quality, uh, you know, with that that big uh, workforce on site, and you know, so you know what's driving that decision? I think you know, as I think you've said, is cost, right? And you know, the problem with that is, you know, if you if it's happening down south where the weather is relatively uh, benign at this point, you know. Uh, it, that may be okay, but you know, from a resilience and sustainability standpoint, um, you know, in a warming climate, it's not going to work out in the long run. You know, and you know, it's it's still going to happen. It's going to happen because it's cost driven, right? Uh, but it's a problem. I mean, you know, in in many respects, I think you know we are quite literally, and we have been for a long time, building tomorrow's problems today with the hot solutions that we're delivering today. Well, let's just cut to the chase and say what's ultimately going to move the needle. And if I think about as of late, the biggest drivers are these new codes that are suddenly popping up and being enforced. Again, the, the stretch code in Massachusetts, you say, OK, interesting. What are the U value targets? Whatever. But all of a sudden, that's requiring passive house level air infiltration. And so all of a sudden it matters how the how qualified your labor force is, because if they don't comply or if they don't meet meet their blower door testing, what are they going to do? It's too late. And so, you know, a code like that, the bird friendly local on 97, the, these codes that are suddenly being implemented and forcing the market to change. Um, I think there's something to learn from that. You know, even yeah. we have no choice but to adopt. Yeah, we can't, you know, we can't have enough of that. We need more of it. You know, it's, it's the problem is it's not happening fast enough or as aggressive enough, right? I mean, I, I would just amplify those things. So, you know, our mission at Facade, Te at the, uh, at Facade Technology Institute is to accelerate that change, right? So what that means, what that translates into is a number of different things, but probably the lead thing is accelerating the change in codes towards more aggressive, uh, you know, code, code standards. And you see that happening with the stretch codes in, in Canada, and you can see how that acts as a driver for technological change there, right? And so, you know, and the thing is, it's, you know, it's all, it's all basically voluntary here in the US. So, you know, New York, Seattle, uh, you know, these, some of these cities, it's kind of up to the urban areas, increasingly up to the urban areas to adopt these, these, these uh, more ambitious standards that even a lot of times go beyond code, uh, and yeah, that's, a, that's a big deal. And it's important for the cities to do that, right? If the, if you're not going to do it on a, on a national or international basis, then, 
you know, these mayors, the, the, the governance of these big urban areas have a lot at stake, right? So I really, really appreciate, you know, like the kind of stuff that I've seen in New York City and Seattle where the, you know, the, the local governance has really taken these things on, getting serious about it and, and, and being much more progressive with these changes than we typically see. I think this was a phenomenal conversation and I really appreciate both of you coming on and, and just given your involvement in facade tectonics and uh, the message that the Institute or organization is trying to push, uh, what, what's the best way for people to find it, understand what the mission is and get involved? Well, the mission, you know, the, the mission is, it's a, it's a great mission, right? I mean, it's, it is uh, unconflicted, right? There is no vested interest. It's purely about resilience and sustainability. Uh, and accelerating, accelerating progress towards those vital goals. And, uh, and, and the other thing is that one of the primary messages that we're trying to bring, and it's still, this is still something that is not recognized in the industry. You know, we talked about a little, we touched on zero emissions, right? In the pursuit of zero emissions, which is a big, you know, this is a, a big emerging consciousness now in the, you know, in, in the building industry, uh, at least in the, in the design part of the building industry, the path, to zero emissions in buildings and urban habitat goes right through the building skin. I mean, it is the key to achieving this stuff. And yet very large portions of the industry still don't understand that, you know? So trying to bring that message to the building industry is a big part of what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, we're, we're, um, we've got, uh, we're a volunteer organization, we're a nonprofit. Uh, we rely on, uh, on our volunteers to do this stuff. And you know, volunteerism is not what it used to be back. You know, in the early, in my early days, you know, under the Kennedy administration, when volunteerism was really celebrated, and you know, a lot of people, you know, were were compelled to volunteer. Now everybody's so busy, it's tough to get you know to, to, for for people to elbow out the time. But you know, the, th the reality is, every building that we build as an industry is another punch in the jaw to the ecosystem, you know, and to biodiversity and stuff. So. You know, it is really critical that all of the practitioners, all of us in the building industry, elbow out enough time to just do the right thing. And by the way, doing the right thing, that's what facade tectonics is all about. It's a platform for doing nothing but the right thing, right? So, and you know, we're, uh, there's a lot of ways to get involved. We have committees and, you know, various committees. And I mentioned the Adv advocacy committee, uh, but we're, you know, the, the website is uh, facadetectonics.org. Um, and uh, we have a Skins newsletter. Uh, we have a Skins podcast. Uh, we have, you know, a number of media channels. We've got a big World Congress coming up in October, and we're taking it on the road for the first time out of LA uh, to Salt Lake City. Uh, it's October 8th and 10th. Uh, and our World Congress is essentially um, peer review, paper driven. So, you know, uh, the speakers are mostly people that have navigated a paper through a, a blind peer review process uh, that this, this year was administered by uh, Isla Aksumija at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. So that's where the World Congress is gonna be on campus at the University of Utah. Um, and we're, we're gonna announce for our big event in 2025, our Vitruvian Honors and Awards program for 2025, right? So, you know, it's um, a really robust recognition program, which I think is another thing that our industry is not very good at is recognizing who's doing great stuff and celebrating that stuff. So yeah, that's uh, that's kind of what we're up to in a nutshell. There's a lot to talk about there, but we'd need another session. Another episode, that, that was pretty badass. Um, th thank you both for hopping on, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you for the invitation, Adrian. I enjoyed it a lot too. Let's do it again sometime. Cheers, Thanks, Mitch. Take care. Okay, guys.